Okay, awesome. So hi everyone, and thank you for joining to our event, tuning to an event. We are really happy to have Arjun with her with us right now. And we are super glad that Arjun is able to provide his Sunday. He could have woken late today, but he woke up early today for us. So thank you, Arjun, for joining us today. Uh, we would love to have this PM estimation questions, how we can solve them very in a very easy manner, and how Arjun has mastered it to be to become a Google APM right now. So I'll I'll get things started and let Arjun take the floor. Thank you, Arjun, for joining us. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Anish, and the entire Product Buds community to kind of do all the logistics behind this um, and make really make some time um, in your on your Sunday mornings as well to host this session. I will I have a deck to present. Um, Anish, is the best way if I just present on my screen? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I will go ahead and do that. Um, I don't use Zoom as much, obviously. <laughs> so I might try yeah, to okay. here. Uh, yeah. But let's see. Hopefully it's not that hard. Okay. Yeah, we can see the screen. Perfect. You can see my screen. Awesome. Can I see y'all though? Okay. Um, cool. So I'm going to talk about estimation questions today. Um, we might not take the entire over here, but maybe around 30, 40 minutes. And then I'll, I want to leave some time at the end for questions about just product. I know we have like a global audience here. So it's pretty cool to see where everyone is from. I think that's like super, super exciting. I do have, uh, I, can, I can give the US perspective, um, but I'm, I'm happy to like answer some product questions or at least how the, my first year in product has been. Um, so let me start off by sharing a little bit about me uh, and then we'll go through what is estimation why do interviewers care about this? This was like my biggest problem with estimation was like, who cares? And why, why, should, we, why should we even ask this? And uh, why are we being tortured by estimation questions? But there's apparently a good reason for it. I'll explain it. Um, and then I wanna give my approach, uh, share some tips and tricks, go through a sample question, and then open it up for any question you have. Um, with that, let me share a little bit about me. Um, so, I graduated from the University of Washington last year. Um, I ended up taking five years and that's an important call out because I spent one year basically in this weird phase of like, oh, I wanna do PM, but I don't have any experience in PM. So how do I break into this field? So it took me about, I would say six to eight months to figure out how to break into getting my first PM internship. And it was painful. And I had to spend another year uh, basically at, at university because of this uh, mid-career, mid-university career pivot. Um, so it was, it was crazy, but it worked out. Um, so it did that, happy to talk about what it is like and if it's worth taking another year at school. Uh, I studied computer science. I think computer science 4 p.m. gives you a good edge because you can interview at in multiple places. Um, otherwise you get restricted at uh, only a few companies that are willing to accommodate non-CS major. So if you can major in tech or at least get a minor there, I would recommend doing that. Um, you would get a lot more um, interviews. The second thing is I had, I've done, I've given over 20 plus PM interviews um, officially at companies. So 20 plus different companies that I've done PM interviews with. It's been a crazy process. Um, I've done easily over hundred plus mocks and I kind of encountered the number of rejections. My, there was a friend I had at, at university who every time got a rejection letter would take a screenshot and put it in a folder, which is the most bizarre thing I've heard and like heard anyone do. Um, and I just asked him how, like we probably applied to the same number of like internships as, as he did. And he applied to around 200 over his time at university. So I'm sure it's like at least 200 rejections. Um, and it just gets, you think that one internship will help you get the next one, but the rejection rate is still like pretty high up. Um, so referrals is the way to go. Okay, in terms of like previously what I did, since I spent five years, I could do four summers and did four internships. Um, I did two in software engineering, which is when I realized that, wait a second, PM is cool. I did two PM and I got this interesting mix of like working at big tech, so the Microsoft and midsize, so it's like a thousand people organization called Smartsheet and then startup which is like a 10 people organization. Um, so I got this like varying experience and it was amazing. Um, I think 
it was awesome to see companies at these different stages and how roles vary. Happy to talk about that too in the Q&A. Right now, I'm an APM at Google, APM Associate Product Management. Uh, it's a two-year kind of program. I think of it as like undergrad at Google in product management. And it's actually, they treat it like a, uh, like a university and like kind of a graduation thing because at the end of your two years, you graduate from the program. Um, so it is very much like the student atmosphere. You have a lot of mentors, a lot of coaching, just to help you learn about the product space in general and how Google thinks about product management. Uh, my first team that I've been on for the past year has been hotels. Um, so some of you might know travel, like Google Flights uh, as a more popular product. And um, I think that hotels and flights and things to do, all these are really cool niche spaces for Google. And, um, and it's amazing to see how by just typing hotels near me, the product gets pulled up and there's so much more that um, you can offer to yeah. users from the search mm -hmm. engine. Huh. So that is, a, that is a little bit about me. I noticed, I noticed there are some questions. Do you, I think I have pauses in between to go over questions, but if anyone has a, a burning question, happy to take them. Yeah, I, I think we can take the questions in the end um, okay. uh, for, for anything. Um, but yeah, when you have the pauses and the interaction with the, when the floor is open, we can definitely have raise hands. So whenever anyone is having any question, please feel free to raise your hand and then we can let you go. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Um, great. I will. Okay. So let me start off by talking about estimation questions, which is what you all are here from. Um, and I think these are like, can be the easiest questions to tackle, but also just the hardest to like learn. Um, my understanding of like what estimation questions is, is like basically I'm on the other side now uh, where I'm looking at like I'm interviewing candidates and trying to understand how Google um, kind of does, wh why they ask certain questions. Obviously like all the opinions here are my opinions when I was preparing, um, but I can share some insight on just like why companies in general ask this. Um, it is not the opinion of, of my employer Google to kind of, uh, and this is how we're supposed to crack them in a sense, right? Um, so from an estimation perspective, these questions also known as for me questions. Um, like number of golf balls that fit in 1737. I think this question is like banned now at many companies because it's so widely mocked and there are like business insider articles written on it saying that, look at this dumb question that companies ask, right? So uh, I, would, I, I don't think you should get something like that, but you should still know how to solve it. Um, a lot of like the reason why companies ask this is um, they want to test kind of your logical and reasoning skills. And I've noticed like consulting companies ask this a lot more. So if you go towards the consulting space, um, you will find a lot, of, a lot of those interviews include this. And I was listening to, I think uh, an interview by the CFO of Google, um, Ruth Porat, and she was kind of giving a Stanford talk and she was saying someone at like McKinsey or one of these other consulting sequence companies she was coming from asked some crazy questions like these. And I was like, oh, I can see the roots of how this ended up in Google's interview process. Um, and same with like today, even uh, Sundar Pichai is from like McKinsey. So a lot of very data-driven, very logical, very reasoning. Um, it's a good proxy of like the type of questions company asks. You can expect like internally, that's how they probably are making decisions. Um, so it is common. It's a dual kind of thing. You can all, you'll get a lot of benefit if you're interviewing for consulting roles. Um, but in product, I think only a few companies ask this, but it is an important part, of, especially if you're looking at some of the big tech companies like Google. Um, does it truly matter? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think it depends. Uh, the question, I think doesn't, uh, no one cares about it. The thinking behind your answer, like absolutely. I, I look at it as like a way for interviewers to do apple to apple comparison because the question they ask you, right? Typically they've asked to like 20 or 30 candidates, right? So they're seeing how your response will differ. Right? So it's kind of like a standardized question for them. And if you can provide some interesting insights or like you can approach the question a little differently or you have a more organized way of approaching it than other candidates, wonderful. Like that means that you'll get higher ratings and which could end up in an offer. Uh, real world, um, this is used a lot. Like I use estimating estimations a lot, but I have a lot more data with me. Um, when I'm kind of deciding and scoping a feature, I'm thinking about like how many people use it. 
what does success look like? How can we quantify it? And these are like daily conversations on an extent and leadership constantly asks this. And they're like, oh, how confident are you with this like success metric or this uh, or number of people that will launch it or number of people that will use it? And to be honest, like a lot of times you're really off, but just if you're good at estimating, you can figure out which feature to actually work on versus which ones do not. Um, so it's an important skill, I think, it comes in handy in the PM role and I use it on a day-to-day -day basis. But from an interview perspective, I think with so much ambiguity, they just want to see how you thrive in it. All right, with that, again, this is the best way to test your skills. I honestly don't know. I do think it's better than lead code though, um, in terms of, I think it's more practical. You will use it every day in your PM life. Um, whereas lead code question, I'm not so sure. Lead code, for those of you who don't know, um, is kind of like this software engineering interview prep um, kind of space. Okay, so my approach on how do you go about solving and um, on solving like this is first is an estimation question you wanna clarify. I think golden rule of thumb is clarify for at least, spend at least five minutes clarifying a question. And if it's like stupidest and easiest question, I would spend at least five minutes like trying to poke around and see if there's like some hidden thing that like an interview is hiding and not giving me. And you really want to ask, it also gives you a lot of time to just like think about what your next steps are. The second thing is data. Um, you want to start listing everything you know about the space, right? I'll get into this, we'll do a sample question. Um, and the third one is like formula. Try to keep it as simple as like pluses, minus and subtra subtraction. If you're trying to go into like modulus or like any of this like crazy kind of formula that you're coming up with, you're almost, going to fail because it's too complicated um, and you don't have a calculator with you. You have to do all mental math. And so keep the formula really, really simple. Uh, step four is like kind of solve it. Um, five, think about edge cases or do a sanity check. You could swap out five and six based on what, whatever you think. If there are no edge cases coming in mind, just jump to sanity check. Um, so this is my approach. It has worked well for me. This is very similar to a lot of approaches you'll find in books too. Um, but what I want to do in our talk today is kind of tell you what I'm thinking exactly when I'm going through these steps, right? Like we'll do this kind of interesting dance because a lot of times in books, you just read or you just read like what an interview, what they're saying or how they came up with these numbers, but actually what's going on in your head is sometimes very different. So I'm gonna do it's like what I'm thinking versus what I actually write down on a whiteboard uh, kind of scenario. So we'll, we'll do that in a sample question. Okay, I have some tips before I get started. Um, so, Understand the question category. Like there are different question categories for estimation. Um, typically um, they are like technical, like, like, oh, what is the storage cost of Google for Google Photos? Um, what is like revenue of, I don't know, like a, of Airbnb? And like, you can do market sizing. How big is the yoga market, uh, yoga mat market in the US, um, right? So there's all these like market sizing. There's also, like just random ones, like what is the weight of a car? It's just super random, but like typically they fall into like three or four categories. And um, I think if you just do a bunch of questions, you will can quickly understand which category you're going, this question falls under. And like, this really helps you figure out if you do a top-down or bottom-up strategy, right? So what do I mean by top-down and bottom-up? Top-down is taking like this big number and then like making it smaller. So US population, and then going, drilling it further down into like a number that's understandable um, or that's more meaningful to the question. Um, the second is the bottom up, which is like, I have no idea what the top numbers look like. So I'm just gonna start with like my personal story or just in Seattle, like I'm in Seattle right now. So um, just like, what are the figures in Seattle? And then like really use that to build up my answer and scale it up, right? So that's why I know your city stats or wherever you're located really well, like what's the population of your place? like in your friend circle, like how many people are using one product versus another? Like, what is the trend you're seeing, right? Um, what is hot and in, incoming in like in your city? These things really help. And I'll show you how um, when we do a sample question. And every time I don't know how to answer an estimation question, I'm like, all right, what? All you have to do is make assumptions, right? If you can make an assumption and say, this is what I assume, like, great. Like an interviewer is not gonna be like, no, that's a stupid assumption. They're like, okay, that's that's debatable. But if that's your experience, that's fine. Because if you can change that one assumption, your answer might differ a ton. So um, when I'm in doubt, I just be like, oh, in my friend circle, three of us have coffee 
out of five. So I would say like in the US probably, um, you know, we just scale that three to five ratio and be like, all right, like 330 million. And then you do some unit tree calculation and be like, okay, these many million people probably drink coffee. I would tweak it a little bit here and there. Um, so it's not the best way to do it, but if you really don't know what to do, just default to personal experience or your uh, personal life. Fifth one, I don't know why interviews don't do this. They feel, they feel like, oh, I'm wasting an interviewer's time if I don't pause. Um, but I actually think it's the most, it's the best way to show that you are very thoughtful, right? So I constantly, every five minutes, ask for, or every three minutes, be like, I want to pause for a few minutes, think about it, and then like give you an answer. And it's awkward. That silence is really awkward, but you can gather your thoughts together, really think about what you want to say. Um, even if you don't come up with something, at least it signals to the interviewer that you just, you'll think before you speak, right? Um, especially complicated formulas or something that you're really thinking about or thinking of strategy. Um, I'm really bad at like trying to speak uh, while I'm thinking, because I just think that's rambling. So take some time, think about it and then say, and then have a meaningful debate. Um, if an interviewer is pushing back on a lot of your assumptions, I would take that as a sign that the interviewer is trying to help you, um, right? Sometimes they like try to do this like reverse psychology, like do you, can, you, um, can you actually defend your assumptions? But if they're doing it too often, I would take it as a sign that like, okay, maybe I missed something somewhere and take a pause and really look back and step back and see if you can fix it. Um, the sixth tip is dumb down your numbers to make math super, super easy. Um, you'll look really smart when you do like math like 200 times 10, like two, you know, wow, it's 2000. Like when you can do that in millions and billions, like it looks really cool. Um, and every time you come up with an estimation number, at the end of the day, estimation is all about a number. I remember my interview at Google, we were doing an estimation question and uh, I was really confused because the way they like sneakily put in an estimation question, I was like, oh, like, what are you looking for? And they're like, we're looking for a number. Like I want a number at the end of the interview by like this time. And I'm like, okay. So I came up with a number. And then I told them like why, why we are wrong and what assumptions we made. Um, we made that would probably not be true. And so you always wanna to come to a number and then tell like why that number is wrong. I think that's, it just shows that you can think about trade-offs. That was a lot of just tips and theory, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I will pause here. Um, I would just want, before I pause, just share these numbers. This is stuff that you probably have looked at when you have been uh, interviewing, especially practicing like, uh, estimation questions, have a cheat sheet, you know, create a Google doc or whatever, remember these numbers, write them down, look, look at them when you're like practicing, um, when you're practicing your estimation questions. I think the most underestimated um, numbers are usually C usage stats. I think these are really, is a good way to build your like analytical product intuition and your estimation is like, can you know, what is Facebook's like daily active users? What is their attention? What is a uh, click-through rate of a landing page? Like search ads have like a click-through rate of 1.91% on search. Similarly, like landing page on a website has like a 2.35% um, click-through rate on, um, on their like main CTA. So these are some numbers that you can easily look up um, and have, and it helps in like product questions too. And you can easily do like, oh, if Facebook has like 200 million monthly actives, um, that means they're like, like a lot of people are using the app and like a similar app should have probably lower or the retention should be similar in some, some sense or the other. Um, I would say that hardest ones are technical. Like you really have to remember like, oh, what is the GB um, like point, what one GB storage cost? It's like, okay, like S3 costs probably like 20 cents or something. So just know these like numbers, it really helps. Um, there's this one, experience I had, which I think is just fascinating. I want to share it with you all is I was uh, interviewing at Google and like I was sitting outside waiting for my next interview. And there's this like senior guy, right? Like really high up. He is definitely like in his like mid thirties, mid forties and pretty smart. I can tell that like, you're dressed up and he has like this big folder with him and that he's carrying. I, I just spoke to him. I was like, hey, what's that folder you have with you? And he's like, oh, these are all my cheat sheets. I was like, what, what cheat sheets? He's like, oh, for the estimation questions. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? He's like, oh, like all the basic stats, revenue, everything that I had memorized, he just has like a sheet that he's like reading. And I'm like, oh, that's smart. He's like revising everything before going in. And I'm like, are you going to actually use this while answering your questions? And he's like, yeah, I spoke to the recruiter and the recruiter said that I can bring a cheat sheet. 
So I'm just going to take my cheat sheet inside. And if an estimation question comes up, I'll just pull it up and like look at my cheat sheet and answer it. And I'm like, wow, that's, I didn't know you could even do that. So ask a recruiter if it's okay to carry like cheat sheets with you. I think it's impressive you can remember these numbers, but hey, if you want to reduce anxiety during an interview and like if this is the way to do it, then absolutely, I think it's like worth it. Um, and he was pretty high up. So like it is definitely, if, if you're like in a, you're just graduating, like I'm sure they will allow that. Um, I don't know the policies have changed, but this is something, it's not very common, I've not seen it, but um, it is something you can do. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause. Questions on just the theory aspect uh, of estimation and tips, and then we can dive into kind of a sample question I have. Oh, I can't hear Anish. Oops, oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Always have trouble finding the mute button. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask everyone if they can put their question in the chat. And I think there are a few folks who have raised their hands since we'll be only allowing two questions uh, because of the limited time. Uh, more questions will be opening in the end. Let's go with Ritu Raj because I think he was first in the queue. Ritu Raj, why don't you go ahead and mute yourself, unmute yourself? Yeah, and if Rituraj, we can come back to you later. And then I think we have also Nikhilesh in the queue. You might gonna, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, hi, Arjun, thanks for this. Um, so you, you sort of said at, at like your last step, the last logical step in the estimation questions was like to uh, potentially tell them why you're wrong. Um, mm -hmm. um, so like, is that sort of like looking at what assumptions like you've made, like what exactly does that entail? Would you like sort of analyze the assumptions you've made and like, potentially like provide reasons why that they may not be accurate and then sort of go down that path or um, what? Yeah, if you could expand a little bit on that, that'd be great. Yeah, exactly. I think what I do is I just look at, look, there are different ways to kind of go about it, but typically just look at your assumptions and be like, that assumption seems wrong. I, I think that I overestimated that assumption or in my personal experience, like this number just seems really high based on some other facts that I know. Um, so I think it's wrong. And you just want to say if you're higher or lower, right? Like if you think this number is too high, if it's too low, um, it's actually the easiest step because like you can just pick in a like pick a number or pick an assumption you made and just tweak it and be like, I actually think like you know in the example we'll do, um, the the number of sales of this product outside the U.S. are a lot more or a lot less um, because of some personal experience or something like that, right? So I think find a way, find, look at some of the numbers. And if there's a way you can do a sanity check and you see that this is not adding up, like try to figure out why something might not hold true. Um, always be a little skeptical of your own answer because you just came up, came up with it in like 20 minutes. All right, so you would do that even if they didn't like push back on your answer or push back on like the, the sort of number you came back with. You sort of analyze it yourself and be like, okay, this might not be right because of X, Y, Z. Yep, always okay. do that before because I think that gives you brownie points, right? Okay. Like if. If they actually push, they'll, they'll def always push back. Most of the time I've seen they'll push okay. back. Um, but if you can do it before they actually push back, they're like, oh, smart person. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for the question. Arjun, we have two more questions. Do you want to take yeah. it in the end or we can go right now? We either could either we, way. We could do it now. I'm also going to move this uh, screenshot awesome. back. Uh, or like move back a slide because that GIF is very destructive. Okay. Awesome. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm pronouncing a name correct, Avele, yeah. uh, Avail, you can go ahead. Yeah, your question is, could you say a little more about how to do research on the revenue of profitable and unprofitable sectors? Um, his question was this. Um, not sure if you can hear Avail, if I'm pronouncing yeah. correct. Yeah, um, it's pronounced Aweli, but you're fine. Aweli, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, my question was okay. um, if you could say a little more about how to do research on revenue regarding like profitable versus unprofitable sectors, just so like we know how to narrow that down. And I was also wondering if you could speak on like what you meant by weights of common items on the on this page, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but profitable, unprofitable sectors, um, the one thing I love to do is it's kind of nerdy, but like, listen to quarterly calls of companies, right? Um, like, it's just fascinating when you listen to 
kind of Google's quarterly calls or like Amazon's quarterly calls, they report numbers. Um, like I think recently last year, Google broke down their like, they never disclosed their YouTube revenue and now they disclose it. And you're like, oh, oh my gosh, like how much money is actually YouTube making, right? It's like 6 billion. Um, and you're like, all right, like, is that, is that a quarter? Is that annually? Are they actually profiting out of that? Like there are a lot of these finance guys on Wall Street that actually try to estimate um, what is the most revenue making and profit making kind of sector um, or a product within that company. And I think it's just like fascinating to see from a business angle. Sometimes you just don't know, but you know like, okay, advertising in general is a very profitable space if you have like a lot of data, a lot of users. If you have like 1 billion users, advertising will probably work really well and it's very scalable. But if you have fewer users, maybe like advertising is a pretty silly because it's all impression impressions, right? So um, you want to kind of see which products that you use, are they actually contributing to a company's bottom line or are they in a sense a strategy to help you use another product? This is very famous in Prime. Like I'm a Prime subscriber. I don't think they make any money out of Prime, right? Like I think a lot of it is just like keep you in the Amazon ecosystem and sell you so much more stuff. Like why do they have Prime Video? Why do they have um, all these other like Prime services? Like half the services, I don't even know they offer, but they're good enough that when I go to cancel it, I'm like, ah, oh, look, I get all these like cool things with it. Maybe, maybe it's worth it. Um, so how do companies think about this? Maybe it's a competitive edge for them. Um, and I can go on about profitable, non-profit, it's really exciting, but that's, that's one way to think about it. For the weight, this is like just dumb, but sometimes companies will ask you like, how much does an aircraft weigh? It's an estimation question. And if you don't know weights of like carbon items, like, oh, how much does like a, um, like steel cost uh, or like steel weigh or one pound of steel or something like that. Like just have like basic metrics, one pound of like brick. Um, these are really random things. Sometimes like even just knowing how to um, convert from tons to like one metric tons, one ton, 2000 pounds and all that kind of stuff, pounds to kgs. Um, these things like one gallon of water is how much if you're asked to estimate a tank, right? Like how much water is in a tank? You can do all of these things. I think you just want to get comfortable with knowing some of the weights and you don't want to be thrown completely off track um, if you're like given a estimate a weight of a car and you don't know like how much an engine weighs or like how to estimate density and stuff like that. Um, so doing a few weight questions will give you an idea of like what I mean, but it's just random and you don't want to be thrown um, completely, you want to be completely blanked in an interview when this is asked because you don't know common items. All right, there's a long winded answer, but I hope that helps. Cool, thanks Arjun. Um, we have two more questions. Do you want to go ahead? I think we have one from Ava and one from DJ. We have a DJ in the house, nice. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do, you, do, do you think we can go ahead with one more question? Yeah, let's do one more and then I'll yeah. jump to the uh, example question and then let's just cool. keep it open for q &A. Yeah, we'll keep it quick, super quick. Um, hi, DJ, you can you can go ahead with your question. Yeah, mine is pretty short. I was just curious about how long do you typically spend on the estimation question in your interview? Like 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Um, do you allocate time for the interviewer to talk? Like total time, like how, like how long do you spend? Yeah, it's a good question. I think if it's like an outright like estimation question, um, like you start off the interview, you kind of do your tell me about yourself kind of dance. And then after that, they're like, all right, here's an estimation question, go for it. You basically do the rest of the interview, right? Um, to do it so you can take 40 minutes and you can go really detailed. Um, but if you only have like 15 minutes or 20 minutes and it's like a second question in interview, just trim down all the steps, right? The best part is like, you probably don't need to calculate everything. You can just like, just put out formula and say, oh, this is the formula. I'll just plug these numbers in. Like your process should make sense. Like I'll just plug these numbers in and then like I'll get this number. I think it might be a little high or low based on like this assumption. That's it. Like that's how I would wrap it up. Um, if they really push you towards like a number, then do some quick and dirty math, but I wouldn't go too deep. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you everyone for the question. Uh, we'll come back to more questions. Feel free to raise your hands. And yeah, let's get started to the fun activity, which is something good. Arjun, let's go. Yeah, awesome. So I want to do a sample question to show how like this approach and tips come in, come in use. Um, so 
the question I selected is like seemingly easy one. It's like estimate number of iPhones sold last year. Um, I think that this is one of the easiest questions you can get in, in, an, uh, in an interview because it's just, you know so much about iPhones, you use it. Um, I wanted to select it because a lot of you probably have solved something very similar to this. And I want to show like how I would approach it from like with a lot of the nuance here, right? So you probably have done something similar. It's a very popular question in like a lot of the interview prep books too. Um, but here's how I would do it. So first I would start with clarifying, right? And this is what I mean by spending three to five minutes really, really understanding it. Um, I was like, all right, let's look at numbers. Uh, when you say number, you're talking about units, not revenue, which market is global or US, right? So really, really focus on what they mean by number. Every word is like really, really broken down to like understand. Um, and sometimes interviewers will just like, this can become such a complicated question so easily because of the clarifying question you ask, but it shows that you're thinking holistically and you're thinking comprehensively. So at this point, I don't think about like, what is it going to make it really easy for me to estimate? I just ask about like, what is the, it's so ambiguous. What have I not, what do I not know? Or maybe something an interviewer is hiding that I need to know that will help me with this if I have infinite time, um, right? Imagine you have like infinite time and you can forecast this. What are some questions you would ask, right? So I would like, okay, iPhones, which models are we talking about? New, old, um, like I know iPhones in the Apple's revenue balance sheet, they report iPhones and they include like accessories there and say, this is iPhone accessories. So should we think about that? Should we not think about that? Um, sold, is it third party? Should we think about returns? Um, what about secondhand sales? Like someone in the market, like you own an iPhone, you're selling to someone else. Does that count as a sale or are we looking only at Apple's um, kind of sales, right? Uh, should we include online retail, separate it out? And then last year, this is again like, Fiscal year varies. Um, some companies, I think across the world, the fiscal year is calculated differently, the financial financial year. So you want to clarify it's like John 1st to December 31st. Um, does it matter? Probably not, but like it at least helps you clarify all of these. If you don't have enough time now, you want to focus only on the few ones and then you just want to say, this is what I think you mean. Is this right? And then just go forward. But if you have time and you have the entire interview, like I would spend five, 10 minutes here, it really helps you scope the question out. Um, so clarify, and then let's say after you clarify, this is the response you got, right? Like they said, all models, they said units, they said global, uh, they said include secondhand sales, uh, Jan 1st of December. And I'm like, oh my God, this is really complicated now. Like something that could have been super easy. I have just complicated it by asking a lot of cl clarifying questions and that's fine. Cause now you're just showing you can think holistically. And so I keep all these aside. And then I like use the classic PM technique of being like, all right, let's make it simple and scope it only to US and only sold by Apple, right? And only new iPhones or like maybe older iPhones too, right? So I really scope it and I'm like, let's focus on this because I know I can to an extent tackle this because I have numbers, right? And from there, let's like go back to how do you solve these other things that I don't know about. So start with data. So on the right side, this is what I'm thinking. So I'm gonna follow this pattern for the next slides while I'm writing stuff on the whiteboard. So you can see like cursive writing is basically me thinking, left side whiteboard is official when I'm showing the interviewer, right? So first I hear everything that the interview saying about the, uh, about the questions and I'm like, I wanna scope it only to US and only Apple. Interview cannot stop you from doing that. Um, so you're like, cool, let's, let's do that. And then I think about all the data points that I know. I don't write any numbers at this stage. I think it's like, it looks very complicated to start writing numbers. So just like, okay, what do I know? I know US population. I know users that, I need to know users that own smartphone. I need to figure out how many upgrade, how many don't. Uh, what is the net new iPhone buyers? Basically anything that's like relevant. I just like add, add all the data points here. Um, and I'm thinking to myself is what I'm trying to determine first is like, should I go top down or bottom up, right? Um, and top down is probably, or do I need to do a mix of both, right? So top down for me is like, okay, I have this used population. I can probably use age stats to figure out number of smartphone users. Um, then I can use market share stat to figure out iPhone users. Then I have to do something weird with figuring out how to upgrade this, how many people upgrade, I don't know about that. Uh, you'll see how I get that. And um, I start assigning variables to create a formula, that's it. Um, and then I come up with this formula. It's like, okay, X plus Y plus Z. This is my, my formula of number of new iPhones purchased last year. Right, um, 
And then I'm like, all right, let's break it down with an H split. So this is something, this comes in handy now with all your, um, all your knowledge with just stats of whichever country you're in, know your stats, US population, 330 million to begin with. Always keep it to whole numbers, make the math easy. Um, I'm like, 25% oh, of users are probably below 18, 55 is like 80 to 65, 20% 65 plus. These numbers don't like exactly match up. I just convert them into, oh, 80 sounds better than 82.5. You know, the numbers are like a little, you can, um, if you go into like decimals and stuff, you're gonna go and do multiplication on the side. So just don't waste your time on that. Just be like, yeah, two and a half million users, this is negligible, that's fine. Like, let's just focus on, um, let's make sure the big number is right. So that's what I do, um, really dumb down these numbers. So I look at like the less than 18 population. I'm like, okay, one in three probably have like an iPhone or like on a, afford to own a smartphone um, because like anyone under the age of 12, I think will probably not have one, but from 12 onwards, like that's half. So it's like 25 million, one in three. Similarly for rest of the adults and stuff, 180 plus 65 is like, um, okay, it's like 245, but not everyone wants a smartphone, right? And maybe not everyone can afford one. So I'm just gonna drop it to drop that by 10 million, give it 235. Again, these are not exact numbers. And if you really have an infinite time, you would look into income distribution and see how many people can afford an I afford a smartphone and then go from there. But here it's just like rough math and rough assumptions you're making along the way. Um, I usually have a I usually have like a box drawn on the whiteboard. Uh, today's virtual world like uh, in a doc like have a section that just says assumptions main and just list these assumptions you're making, right? Um, so this is kind of how I start with H stats. And then I'm like, all right, like I know um, iOS is more dominant in US than the rest of the world. Um, so the rest of the world, I don't know what the market share is, but I know the US is like 50%. Um, and then I'm like, all right, let's do number of existing iPhone users, uh, probably 130 million, right? Um, and then I have like, okay, how many users now upgrade to the new iPhone that releases every year. This is where I have no idea. My top-down strategy breaks down here. So now I have to think bottom up, right? And I'm like, all right, let's see from my personal, like when in doubt, I'll always fall back to a personal reference. I'm like, okay, in my friend circle uh, of four friends, one in four like have an upgrade yearly. Like I'm one of those upgrades yearly because I'm on the kind of that Apple subscription thing where you just trade in every year. And then two in four like are on their like, um, contracts with their cellular. So they upgrade bi-yearly and the rest probably upgrade yearly, right? Uh, rarely. So I'm thinking about this and I'm like, but my group or my friend group is very skewed towards tech. So I will, one in four is like 25%. I'll reduce that to 20% uh, for the general population, right? And this is how I use my personal reference to scale it up to the broader population. And I'm like, all right, let's, go from here. So 130, 20% upgrade yearly, 40% buy yearly, 40% rarely. The one thing I want to call out is look how easy these numbers are. 20%, 40%. I could easily, it's very tempting to do like 35%, do 25%, 27%. It's going to get really complicated and you'll spend more time solving math than like actually explaining your process. So keep it really, really simple. Um, and then I'm like, all right, so now that I have this, I find the total number of users buying an iPhone is like probably 55 million in the, in the US, right? And then this is what like I did, right? The top down kind of, I think of it as like filtering and really getting to a smaller number. Um, so from here, you want to, let's go with, like, let's now think, now if you have time in interview, you actually have uh, some more time and you can go through some of the questions that you can increase the scope, right? So now I'm like, Okay, we started with 55 million users. Now let's think global, right? Like how many iPhones actually sold across the world? Um, and you know, like market share, market size is um, much larger outside US, but the market share is lower because I know Android has like 70% market share. Uh, so maybe Apple sells like more iPhones outside the US. Should it be two times more, three times more? That's like, I think it's going to be three times more since like 150 million units will probably be like 150 billion. Um, and this is where your revenue numbers come in handy, right? Like if you know Apple's revenue numbers um, from last year, you know that they made like $250 billion. So you're looking at that and you're like, okay, 150, 55, 
um, plus 50 plus 200 billion probably will make sense. So like, let's go with three X, right? Um, and then for 2020, I don't share these revenue numbers right now. I just like think about it in my mind. And I said three X, I kind of list 55 million or 50 million in like US, 150 million rest of the world. It's like 200 million total. Um, and then I'm like, oh, let's do a sanity check, right? Um, and I'm like, an average iPhone on average probably costs $800. Um, right, Apple's revenue is like 250, 65%. So basically I'm saying like 65% of revenue comes from iPhones. Um, that seems a little high to me. Um, like, all right, I know that Apple's like revenue is probably 50%, not 65 from iPhone. So it's like, okay, it's high. I don't know why I got a higher number. And then I think about other things that could that is like kind of wrong with my assumptions. Like think about COVID, think about um, overestimate or underestimate. Um, and I obviously like sometimes just gaze at like kind of an imagine what 160 billion looks like, but yay. Um, and then I think about all the edge cases, right? I'm like, okay, Apple probably sells a lot of expensive computers. Um, there is a semiconductor shortage. This is where your knowledge of just what's going on around the globe really comes in handy. One thing I've started doing a lot is like every weekend read the Wall Street Journal really helpful just to know what's going on in the world. Very, if you can show that you know what's going on and reflect that in your interviews, beautiful, um, right? So I think that COVID probably impacted, not a lot of people are willing to buy phones and stuff. So I'd say, okay, like my number is probably too high for 2020, right? And I know that I read somewhere that App Store makes 10 to 20% of revenue, um, which means that it's probably like, plus computers and all, it's probably like will account for 50% of other revenue. So I would reduce my um, units by a few million and say this is a little too high an estimate, all right? Now, interview might push back and be like, oh, I don't agree with you or whatever. Um, and then you can play this dance based on how much time you have, right? And then you can really tweak and like see if you were to change the num one number here, how does it change the overall unit numbers and stuff like that. So that's how I would go about doing the um, edge cases and um, these these are all the resources I use in terms of like helping me. That's that's it with a sample question. I think it's like just giving you a broader idea of how to think about this. Um, I think the most powerful resource out of all of these is the mocks, especially if you can find two or three like really really good partners um, to do mocks with. Like I made so many friends with uh with mocks and i we created this like it's kind of shitty but we, we created this group of um four or five really good product people who were practicing like crazy and i was like i'm only going to practice with these four or five people and if i come across someone who's just as good as them i want to add them to this facebook group and that that way we only practice with people who are really really serious um and you don't spend a lot of time with people who are just getting started. Um, there are a lot of people who also just have like, in your, while you're doing mocks, you can add um, this requirement that I will only practice only if you've done 30 plus mocks, right? Um, I think you want to raise the quality of your mocking experience a lot. And I think it just makes you, it helps you do like silly questions like these ones. Like, how long does it take to drain water from a bathtub using a straw? Like, there's no way I would take this seriously if I'm doing this by myself. But if someone's asking me this, I would actually have to think through it and be like, oh my God, this is so dumb, but I have to, I can't say that, I have to do it. And then I do it and I realize like, oh, this is actually really hard. And I messed up a lot. Um, so definitely do a ton of mocks. Um, and then you have these other resources that you can look at. I think my, my whole method is it coming from cracking the PM chapter seven, I think. Um, but I definitely use that and then kind of made it my own. Um, and I also have like my own article on navigating APM interviews. It's my most widely read article. I think it's like really helpful. And I get, this is the number one question I get. How do, how do you prep for APM interviews? So um, that's another resource. Um, I think one point I'll add here, which I don't include resources is just read a ton about products, um, use products and try to understand why something is working, something is not working. Um, Maybe if you're in a restaurant and you're sitting down to eat and you have time with yourself, maybe uh, you're there, your friend went to a restroom or something, 
just like look around and see how much money this restaurant must be making, right? Like think about it. It's a great estimation question. You're like, all right, like they're probably 80% full, 50% full on weekend, on weekdays. Um, how much money they must be making? Like do these like mental math exercises. Um, I think it's just fun. And if you don't enjoy doing any product questions or estimation questions, um, there should be a sign that like maybe you want to enjoy like product roles in general. Um, so definitely, I really enjoy product interviews. I miss my product interviews. That's something I try to replicate at work with like product conversations and product observations. Um, so I think it's a fun way to get like a nano degree in PM, especially if you're starting out. Um, cool. So those are all the resources. It's like my um, spiel on estimation questions. And yeah, happy to take questions from now onwards, talk anything about um, product, talk about how to prep for interviews in general and estimation questions if you have questions on the sample one um, that we just did. Cool, I'll open the floor up for questions. Thanks Arjun, that was really insightful. And I can also share having that mindset whenever you visit a restaurant or everywhere, having that open mindset and using those products and wait, why is this happening? Why is Microsoft acquiring Discord or why is this not happening? So that really helps to have the strategy in alignment with all the estimation. So thanks for the suggestion session. I love the exercise as well. I'm sure everyone also liked it. Um, I think we have one question from Ava pending from the last one. Um, so Ava, you can go and unmute yourself and ask the questions. Um, meanwhile, we can have other folks as well. They can also raise their hands and, um, or feel free to put in the chat. Um, Ava, you wanna go? Or, okay, an alternative to that is I can read out loud her question, uh, which might be also helpful for other folks around. It was, what platforms do you use to do all these mocks to practice with other people? Yeah, the number one I used was um, Exponent. I think, I, I don't know if folks know of Exponent. It's by this former Google APM X and X Stanford grad who's like, um, he created this like platform where you can go and practice interview questions. That's pretty, pretty famous now. When I was interviewing, it was pretty janky. It just, just got started. It's very new. Very few people knew about it. So the quality of people paying, like it was not even subscription based. It was like, just you pay hundred bucks and then you get access to all this content and you join a Slack group. Um, and I met a ton of people on that Slack group. And I realized that people who are willing to pay to do like interview prep, um, they probably are taking it more seriously. And I met a lot of folks from Stanford and like MIT and Harvard and like these amazing universities. And I was a little intimidated after meeting them. And I'm like, wow, like they are going very serious into this. And I like quickly friended a lot of those people and made a small group. And I'm like, we'll just practice with each other and give each other valuable feedback. So we don't have to pay really, um, we don't have to pay like crazy amounts for coaching. And that actually worked out like a lot of, out of the six people or seven people that were in my group, five of us landed APM offers. And one of them actually is at Google with me um, right now. And I had never met her. And like, we ended up getting the offer and we were like crazy that uh, the number of like spots available and we both ended up getting an offer and we both never interned at Google before. Um, so it's really powerful. If you can find people who are giving you really good feedback, you wanna uh, hold on to them. Or even if you're interning at a company, like reach out to the senior PMs there and ask them if they're willing to do a mock with you because senior PMs will be very strategic um, and sometimes it's very helpful to just learn from them on how they approach product interviews. Uh, so I think that's the way to go about it. I think Facebook is another great place. So Facebook groups, um, whoever's doing, it's a hit or a miss, try it, works, does not work. All you're trying to do is like get to those five, six people who are really good and then make them your like best friends for the next two, three months. Sounds good. Thanks, Arjun, for the insight. And I would also like to add that we are also having this PM interview prep. Everyone is really serious. That's why you all turned in. So feel free to reach out to other folks who have joined this interview or this event. And you can also have the, that session with them. And you can have you can find your pairs as well in Product Buds PM interview prep channel. So yeah, feel free to use that space as well. I'll go on to the next question. I think Prasoon has their hands raised up. And next is Avili. So Prasoon, you can go ahead. Hi, Arjun. Thanks for this interesting session. 
I wanted to ask whether you follow any particular blog or website to be updated about what's going on in the product world. Yeah, uh, good question. And before I answer that, I think plus one to Anisha, I think Product Buds was not there when um, when I was interviewing, so I had no idea. But this is like a very vibrant community, so definitely lean on each other. There's also a Lewis Lynn channel, uh, who's the author of Decode and Conquer, uh, which is a famous PM book. So that's that's another place you can look for buddies. Okay, back to your question. Um, what places? What places do I kind of read? I have included a lot of those resources in my um, navigating APM interviews um, kind of article. So you can see what podcasts I listen to, what books I read. But I find like just reading a bunch about any new business book that comes out, I've always like reading it. Like I think two weeks ago, a new Amazon book came out, Amazon Unbound. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Uh, so I went and kind of bought it. And the first chapter is the Uber product manager, right? Like um, it's Jeff Bezos himself how he kind of decides what happens and which products get launched and why the Fire Phone failed, why Echo has taken off, what is going on with cloud, like there's so much insight there. Um, so I think reading business books is really a great way of figuring out or being in touch with your kind of product skills. The second is um, reading some kind of like global news newspaper, right? Just to know what's going on, the trends. I do that through the Wall Street Journal, there's the New York Times, there's the Washington Post, there are all these other ones, maybe globally that are different in your region. But you should just know what's going on in the tech industry and across and how sometimes like politics and these other factors influence tech. Um, there's also Stratechery, which is by Ben Thompson. It's more strategic uh, insights and analysis of the tech industry and what's going on. Sometimes I find it useful, sometimes it goes over my head. It's fine, I still read it. If, if I find it interesting, a lot of good podcasts to listen to. And so I have that in my article if one, one list them out. But here, those are the top things I do. There are also newsletters um, that I've subscribed to recently, which are not in that article. One of them is by Ken Norton. He is a, um, it's kind of this like ex Google PM and right now just as coaching. And he's been at Google for 13 years and writes about his like career and just insights and he's considered a big product leader in the space. Um, so definitely Ken Norton. The other one is Lenny. I can't say his last name, but if you just Google Lenny Airbnb growth PM, <laughs> uh, his, his newsletter will pop up. And he also does full-time just, you know, um, writing about PM stuff. Lenny's newsletter is paid. So it's Ben Thompson's Stratechery. I think it's worth it. 10 bucks a month to keep your strategic skills high uh, and sharp is, is, is definitely is definitely fine. Um, yeah, so those are some things I look at. Also talk to product friends, like product what's a good community between and human talks or just talk to some other people about cool products you're using and why you think they're cool or not. Um, yeah, those are all my tips. Thank you, Arjun. Um, I have asked folks to reach out to you on LinkedIn and feel free to Give a give Arjun a shout out on LinkedIn, and you can share screenshots from this presentation. And feel free to give Arjun a shout out on LinkedIn, so that everyone can also get benefit from this community. We'll be posting a YouTube video soon. We have just one more question. I think Avili has one last question, and then we can wrap the session up. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead, Avili. Yes, thank you so much, um, Arjun. Um, I was just wondering because I know you mentioned in the beginning that referrals are important. And I was just wondering how to navigate that, like when we connect with people, like just how that process works. Cause I've always been confused. Like I've heard about it, but I just never knew like how to handle that. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's probably a topic that uh, deserves its own talk on how to get, how to get an interview is definitely, it's, a, it's a very hard. Um, I underestimated even with referrals, how hard it is to get an interview for context. I had four internships and I got only like three APM interviews. Was just, I was really surprised. I thought I would at least get a lot more calls. Um, and so when it comes to PM, you really wanna make sure that when you are applying, you will get in and but show whatever interview you get, you have to nail it. Like you should look at like, this is, there's no like, oh, uh, I'm just practicing with this company for my dream company. Cause you might not get a call from your dream company, right? So like you wanna go all in. In terms of how to get a referral, 
uh, if you don't have, I would look at alumni on LinkedIn and do your kind of standard, go to alumni, see who works there. Do you have second degree connections at that, at that company? Can you do intros? Um, as hard as it probably sounds now, or some of you might regret this, but the best time to get your referrals and all your game high in terms of optimizing to get an interview is from Jan to June. Like your first six months is like, that's time when you just go in and be like, I'm really curious on how this company works. I have no intention of getting a job because like you have no openings. But like later in summer when openings do open up, you're like, oh, thank you for all that knowledge. Like now I want to go ahead and uh, um, apply for some of your internships. And you know, you, you were really insightful. Can you help me? Uh, can you refer me internally? I'm not saying you cannot do it now. You should do it, but now you should focus a lot more on on improving your interview skills. At least in the US, this is like the timeline, right? Um, so look at when does recruiting season happen and minus three months or four months, and that's when you start doing a lot of networking. Um, I'm sure if you reach out to enough number of people, pay for a LinkedIn premium, whatever, right? They, they charge in a sovereign amount, but it's okay. Like if, even if one of those connections works out, you will, it'll pay off in the long run. That's how I got like two of my internships was just reaching out to people, going meeting them, having calls with them online and then later being like, hey, it was such a productive call. I really would love if you could like refer me. I see this opening at your company. And most of the time your students, they're like, oh, I wanna help this kid. So they'll help you. Thank you so, so much. Makes sense. Yeah, thanks Arjun. And I think I would also like to add to this because this didn't work for me, uh, posting on LinkedIn about your learnings and your journey and whatever you're sharing with the community also helps for recruiters to get attracted to your profile. And they see so much insight in your posts and they truly believe that you do have a vision. So I think that can also help you to get um, good attention from good companies probably. So yeah, that also helps too. So thank you for the insightful question, everyone. We are really glad that you all tuned in and shared your time with us. And we are excited to put this on a YouTube channel. So thank you. And uh, last but not least, Arjun, thanks a lot for this. Um, we are look, really looking forward for more events in future, probably. And thank you so much for helping this community. We are glad to have you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Anish. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. We are closing off now. Really glad and have a great weekend. Bye.